Hello and welcome to Wineskins, a program that features the lives of the saints and reflections on the Sunday readings, along with information on a variety of topics and issues from a Catholic perspective. I'm Father Jim Corda. Our program is brought to you through the annual Bishop's Appeal, the Catholic Communication Campaign, and St. Paul's Catholic Books and Gifts, a division of the Society of St. Paul. Our interview segment today will feature Diana Hencherenko. We will also get a glimpse into the life and times of St. Damien of Molokai, along with reflections on the readings for this sixth Sunday of Easter. That and more on Wineskins. Now Father Lavelle will talk about women's rights, domestic violence, and human trafficking in our Life Issues segment. On January 1st of 2020, Pope Francis began the new year with a call for the dignity of women to be honored, not exploited. He said, quote, How many times is the woman's body sacrificed on the profane altars of advertising, profit, pornography, exploited as a surface to be used? If we want a better world, which is a house of peace and not a war zone, we have to care for the dignity of every woman. Pope Francis went on to remind us that the most noble flesh in the world is that of the woman, the woman who brings forth life. It is the culmination of creation. He said that today's world humiliates motherhood by only valuing economic productivity when women's bodies become the purpose of enjoyment rather than creation itself. When women can transmit their gifts, the world finds itself more united and more peaceful. Therefore, we should achieve for women an achievement for all of humanity. As we look at domestic violence, Violence against women, inside or outside the home, is never justified. Violence in any form, physical, sexual, psychological, or verbal, is sinful, and often it is a crime. Domestic violence is any kind of behavior that a person uses to control an intimate partner through fear or intimidation. It includes physical, sexual, and psychological, verbal, and economic abuse. Such examples of domestic violence include battering, name-calling, insults, threats to kill or harm one's partner or children, destruction of property, marital rape, and forced sterilization or abortion. Younger unmarried women are at greatest risk for domestic violence. According to a U.S. government survey, 53% of victims were abused by a current or former girlfriend or boyfriend. One-third of all victims were abused by a spouse, while 14% said the offender was an ex-spouse. Women ages 16 to 24 are nearly three times as vulnerable to attacks by intimate partners as those of other age groups. Abuse victims between ages 35 and 49 run the highest risk of being killed. Domestic violence is often shrouded in silence. People outside the family hesitate to interfere, even when they suspect abuse is occurring. Many times, they even extend denying that this exists. Out of loyalty to the abuser, in order to protect the image of the family. Our mission as a church is to proclaim the good news, which includes the reign of God's peace, justice, and reconciliation as a family of families. Therefore, we are called to stand against anything that destroys families, which are domestic churches. We are called to be workshops of hope, not workshops for the tolerance of violence. Love that protects the vulnerable promotes their flourishing, and sees the inextricable dignity of each person of the family is the only way we can be these workshops of hope and truly proclaim the good news. Should you yourself or someone you know be a victim of domestic violence, please contact the National Domestic Violence Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE. That's S-A-F-E. Another issue that our Holy Father has spoken strongly about is human trafficking. Human trafficking violates the sanctity, dignity, and fundamental rights of the human person. The United Nations Protocol to Prevent, Suppress, and Punish Trafficking of Persons defines it as the recruitment, transportation, harboring, or receipt of persons by means of force, fraud, or coercion for the purpose of exploitation. While predominantly affecting women and girls, every year, Millions of men, women, and children fall into the hands of traffickers in their own countries and abroad. No sector or industry is immune from human trafficking. Victims may be workers in food processing factories, waiters or cooks in restaurants, construction workers, agriculture laborers, 
fishers, housekeeping staff at hotels, domestic help in private residences, and on and on. In 2016, global estimates of modern slavery said that nearly 40 million people were victims of modern slavery. 24.9 million were entrapped in forced labor and sexual slavery. Trafficking lures men, women, and children, but predominantly men and young girls, with false promises of good jobs, education, economic security, and love. Once enticed, traffickers keep their victims from seeking help through means such as confiscating identification documents, threats of violence against the victim or their families, and physical and psychological abuse. For more information, especially in understanding many of the misconceptions about human trafficking, please visit the U.S. Bishop's website at www.usccb.org. For Wineskins, I'm Father Jack Lavelle. St. Damien of Molokai was a priest to the lepers of Hawaii. To tell us more is Brother Dominic Calabro. He is the production assistant at CTNY and a member of the Society of St. Paul in Canfield. When Joseph de Fuster was born, few people in Europe had first-hand knowledge of leprosy. By the time he died at the age of 49, people all over the world knew about this disease because of him. They knew that human compassion could soften the ravages of this disease. The leper priest, the hero of Malachi, was born in Belgium on January 3, 1840. In 1860, he entered the Congregation of the Sacred Heart of Jesus and Mary, taking the name of the fourth century physician and martyr. When his brother, a priest of the same congregation, fell ill and was unable to go to the Hawaiian Islands as assigned, Damien quickly volunteered in his place. In May 1864, two months after arriving in his new mission, Damien was ordained a priest in Honolulu and assigned to the island of Hawaii. For the next nine years, he worked in mission on the Big Island Hawaii. In 1873, after volunteering for the assignment, he went to the leper colony of Molokai, set up seven years earlier. In time, he became their most effective advocate to obtain promised government support. Soon the settlement had new houses and a new church, school, and orphanage. Morale improved considerably. A few years later, he succeeded in getting the Franciscan Sisters of Syracuse, led by Mother Mary Ann Cope, to help staff his colony in Molokai. At his canonization, Pope Emeritus Benedict said, Not without fear and loathing, Father Damien made the choice to go on the island of Molokai in the service of lepers who were there abandoned by all. So he exposed himself to the disease of which he suffered. With them he felt at home. The servant of the word became the suffering servant, leper with the lepers, during the last four years of his life. Damien cared for lepers of all ages, but was particularly concerned about the children segregated in the colony. He announced he was a leper in 1885 and continued to build hospitals, clinics, churches, and some 600 coffins. He died in April 15, 1888 on Molokai. As requested, he was buried there, but in 1936 the Belgian government succeeded in having his body moved to Belgium. Part of Damien's body was returned to his beloved Hawaiian brothers and sisters after his beatification in 1995. When Hawaii became a state in 1959, it selected Damien as one of its two representatives in the Statuary Hall at the U.S. Capitol. He was declared venerable in 1977. Pope St. John Paul II declared him beatified on June 4, 1995, and Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI declared him a saint on October 11, 2009, in the presence of King Albert II of the Belgians and Queen Paola, as well as the Belgian Prime Minister and several cabinet members. Some people thought Damien was a hero for going to Molokai, and others thought he was crazy. To follow Christ, Damien not only left his homeland, but also risked his health so that he might receive eternal life. Damien's symbols are a tree and a dove. In St. Damien's role as an unofficial patron of those with HIV and AIDS, the world's only Roman Catholic memorial chapel to those who have died of this disease at Montreal, Quebec, is consecrated to him. 
The opening prayer of the Mass says, God our Father, in St. Damien of Molokai, you gave a light to your faithful people. You made him a pastor of the church to feed your sheep with his word and to teach them by his example. Help us by his prayers to keep the faith he taught and follow the way of life he showed. For Wineskins, I'm Brother Dominic Calabro. I'm talking with Diana Hentarenko. You know, Diana, when I think about young adults, at least in my experience, I get a little intimidated sometimes by them. I remember when I was a seminarian many years ago, and I taught in high school. And that was a very difficult experience for me. I love working in adult ministry or the little kids, but those ages tend for me to be a little intimidating. Is there any reason why us as adults get a little intimidated by someone who is so young and energetic, but in that age bracket? I'm beginning to start to experience some of the intimidation myself, actually, I think as I'm getting a little bit older. And I think a lot of that is because they do bring a breath of fresh air, something that's very sure. different than what we're used mm -hmm. to and what we can expect normally. And that's supposed to happen. The generations that come up, God is providing for what's needed in the church and what's needed in the world. So I think that, you know, we never want to be replaced either. But realizing that in ministry, realizing in young adult ministry and in the church, it's not a zero-sum game. There's room for everybody at the table. So I think sometimes keeping that mindset is very important as we look and seek to really welcome in young adults into the fabric of the church. I think that that just makes a tremendous difference. But it can be a little intimidating, but um, mm -hmm. once we get to know them, I know once I get to know them and the gifts that they bring and the person personalities that they have and the wonderful gifts they have to share, it makes it a lot easier. What can you share with those folks like myself who might feel that? What can I do to kind of get rid of that experience or that feeling and get a little more comfortable being around them, but also inviting them to be part of the ministry and life in the church? I think the best way to approach young adults and young people in general is out of a spirit of curiosity. I think if we're curious about their lives, and we're curious about their experiences and we get to know them as people, the more that we know people, the less that we feel some of those bad feelings or some of those feelings of intimidation or, or things like that. You can't hate or, or dislike someone that, that you know. So the more that we get to know them, mm -hmm. the more that we walk with them and accompany them to build relationships with them, sure. then that really makes a huge difference in terms of, of overcoming those obstacles. And young adults, even though they're young, they have tremendous experiences to share. Some of them have have really wonderful things that they've done with their lives or things that they've been through that they're willing to share with others if somebody's open enough to, to ask the question. So I think definitely approaching out of a spirit of curiosity and just getting to know them as the wonderful people they are. Let's talk about relationships, how important they are, especially when we're talking about ministry in the church. Yes. We don't do it by ourselves. We do it in communion with other people and in relationship with other people. Why are relationships and building those important for us? Relationships are central. The one-on-one -on -one transmission of the gospel, I know Pope Francis has talked about how effective that is. And just, just kind of sharing those experiences one-on-one, -on -one, realizing the human experiences, mm -hmm. the joys, the sorrows, all of the emotions that we have, that is all encompassing within the church and within the ministry experience. Mm -hmm. So the more we can build up on those relationships, the more we can get to know other people, the more we see Christ. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is just so central to what we're doing. Pope Francis talks a lot in his document, Christus Vivit, on young people, mm -hmm. the need for accompaniment, the need for mentorship, and all of that begins with relationship. It begins with a sense of trust. And that sense of trust really can take a person, you know, just miles as they're journeying in their faith, as they're exploring tough questions, going through different issues in their life. It really makes a difference to have people around you that you trust and that you have relationships with so that you can have that solid foundation of faith as well. Do you think sometimes young people get kind of a bad rap because, you know, oftentimes going back to the beginning of our conversation where people say, well, where are the young people? Yes. Well, they are there. Sometimes we don't see them or we don't hear them. <laughs> Why is it important for us to understand that they're present and we need to be open to that? 
Yes, absolutely. Uh, to answer your question, young people get a bad rap, but, but they get a bad rap, I think, in every generation, as every generation sure. comes through. And I think a lot of that is kind of that intimidation factor that we mm -hmm. talked about mm -hmm. earlier as well. I think the thing with, with the young people coming up right now is that it's not that they're invisible, but they just, they work just a little bit differently than mm -hmm. other generations. Mm -hmm. And that's normal and natural, and that's, you know, how we're meant to evolve. The big question with, with young people now, though, is the time that they have is different than in generations prior. Mm -hmm. It's not a Monday through Friday, eight to five world anymore. Right. So even if we are seeing them at church, we may not see them all the time. Mm -hmm. They may come to mass as they're able, if they're working weekends. Mm -hmm. They may not be able to commit to being involved in an ongoing ministry, but they mm -hmm. can help as they're able. So that's really our job as church then to adapt to some of those changing sure. needs and those, those changing things that are popping up within this generation. But yes, they do get a bad rep, but again, the more we get to know them, the more we get curious about them, the more headway we're going to make. Let's talk about that whole idea of, you know, oftentimes people in the church are not drawn to the institution, mm -hmm. but they're more drawn to the spirituality within mm -hmm. the church. Do we need both? And if so, why? And if one is lacking, how do we get the other? That's a great question. I do think that there is a, is, there is a relationship, certainly, between the spirituality and the institutional church. I think some of the statistics that are coming out about young people is that they may not be as trusting of institutions mm -hmm. and not just the church, but other government institutions, sure. other things like that. Mm -hmm. So again, having relationships, as we mentioned earlier, does help build that sense of trust. Mm -hmm. It builds a sense of understanding. It builds a sense of asking qu those questions so that they can figure out the answers that they need to proceed forward. You know, we know that the church is, is the body of Christ. The church mm -hmm. is those relationships that are formed. So as different questions and as different struggles come up, it's our job to walk with people to figure out uh, what some of those answers might be that the young people would be raising. And I think just to recognize that it, it's just a, a different time, but it's certainly workable. And within those spaces of relationships, much can be discovered. What about family life and how important is family to young people? Because family as we know it is a lot different than it was before sure. and in the future. So how important is family life? I think family life is very important. It's showing up in different ways. And, mm -hmm. and I think, you know, certainly as there have been changes in the family landscapes, you know, having young adults that have come from families of divorce, or many of our young people have actually lost a parent mm -hmm. to illness or to an accident. Mm -hmm. And so being able to deal with that and the spirituality that, that goes with, with mm -hmm. loss, with death, with grieving, mm -hmm. I think is very important. They want to know that they matter. They want to know that uh, they are connected to other people. So that sense of family to them is very important. Mm -hmm. Staying close to siblings, staying close to parents, but then also building up a family that may not be relatives. Sure. Keeping close friendships and having strong spiritual friendships mm -hmm. as well is really meaningful to our young people. And I hear that time and again. So that blend mm -hmm. of, yes, staying close to relatives, but then also building up family and friends and, and building up a strong sense of community means just as much as family does to them. For more information and to listen to Wineskins, visit the website of the Catholic Diocese of Youngstown at www.doy.org. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Mothers and fathers help shape the lives of children God has blessed them with. Catholic Charities feels Mother's Day to Father's Day is the perfect time to hold the annual First Step for Change campaign. First Step for Change helps provide assistance to low-income pregnant women and families with young children in obtaining infant supplies such as formula, diapers, and clothing, as well as case management and parenting support. Last year, Catholic Charities First Step programs assisted over 600 households. Please support the collection at your parish this year from Sunday, May 9th through Sunday, June 20th, or donate online at www.ccdoy.org or call the diocese for more information at 330-744-8451, extension 323. Church World Service believes that being self-reliant is a joy everyone should share. So around the block or around the world, share the joy. Our song today is from the CD entitled Ave Maria. It is a collection of Marian songs. Help 
Blessed Lady, Mother most kind and merciful, Fountain of goodness, hope of life immortal. We are but sinners, children of Eve still in exile. To you we send our son. The trials that will befall us Passing through this veil of sorrow Hear then our plea As our intercessor Turn then to us Those loving eyes compassionate To give us comfort us to Jesus Christ, your Son, in glory. O gentle, O Our scripture reflection for this sixth Sunday of Easter will be done by Father Matt Humrickhouse. He is a sacramental minister at St. Luke Church in Boardman and the parochial vicar at Holy Family Church in Poland. In this weekend's gospel, Jesus tells us, As the Father loves me, so I also love you. Remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love. When he uses the word commandments, We know that he means to love one another as God loves us. Someone who immediately comes to mind as an outstanding model of love is St. John Paul II. The witness of his life was powerful, and on the day of his death, that was all that filled the news cycle. His death was one of those things that we all probably remember where we were and what we were doing when we heard the news. St. John Paul II truly understood what it meant to love as God loves. In his book, Love and Responsibility, he writes, Love consists of a commitment which limits one's freedom. It is a giving of the self, and to give oneself means just that, to limit one's freedom on behalf of another. Take away from love the fullness of self-surrender, the completeness of personal commitment, and what remains will be a total denial and negation of it. Limitation of one's freedom might seem to be something negative and unpleasant, but love makes it a positive, joyful, and creative thing. Freedom exists for the sake of love. This is how John Paul II lived for his people, and it is how Jesus asks us to live for each other. It is easy to hear those words and think of people in our own lives that could benefit from understanding them. We might say, I wish my spouse could embody this more. I wish my boss knew this teaching. I wish my children could understand what it is to love this way. And to that I say, if you want something done right, 
you have to do it yourself. Before we can expect others to embody this, we ourselves must demonstrate this radical way of living and loving. Thankfully, we have the model of all models in Jesus, who demonstrated how this love can be fruitful. Interestingly, this way of living and loving can be painful. Jesus was regularly threatened, chased out of towns, mocked, betrayed by his friends, scourged, and crucified. But this is part of the self-surrender that is absolutely essential to loving in the way God invites us to love. Let's not forget that Jesus told us in the Beatitudes, Blessed are they who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Sounds difficult, right? Well, it is. Failure is quite easy when we try to live this way, but it's okay. There are strong forces working against us. We just need to be open and honest with ourselves, as well as with God. Admit that we failed, and try again. It doesn't matter if you're 7 or 97, constantly learning how to love. And at the bottom of every failure is a new understanding and a new way to improve. Mother Teresa was fond of saying, the only failure is when you fail, you refuse to get up again, and carry on the one important message that the world must learn, that God loves his people. As we go forth into this new week, I pray that God blesses everyone who can hear my voice. I pray that we are all inspired to recklessly demonstrate God's love for our friends and our neighbors. For Wineskins, I'm Father Matthew Hummerkaus. How often have we spoken the words, thank you, most recently? For those who are not members of our family, there is someone who needs to hear those words today. In this moment in time, who have you always wanted to say thank you to? Wineskins is made possible by the annual Bishop's Appeal, the Catholic Communication Campaign, and St. Paul's Catholic Books and Gifts. Wineskins is produced by CTNY, the Catholic Telecommunications Network of Youngstown. I'm Father Jim Corda, saying thank you for being with us. Have a blessed Sunday. And we of CTNY want to wish all of the moms that are with us with a blessed and happy Mother's Day. Mothers and fathers help shape the lives of children God has blessed them with. Catholic Charities feels Mother's Day to Father's Day is the perfect time to hold the annual First Step for Change campaign. First Step for Change helps provide assistance to low-income pregnant women and families with young children in obtaining infant supplies such as formula, diapers, and clothing, as well as case management and parenting support. Last year, Catholic Charities First Step programs assisted over 600 households. Please support the collection at your parish this year from Sunday, May 9th through Sunday, June 20th, or donate online at www.ccdoi.org or call the diocese for more information at 330-744-8451, extension 323.